Hey, Brett, how you doing tonight, man? Oh, I'm doing all right, Sensei. How about you? Uh, not too bad. So I um, kind of wanted to talk about a few things pertaining to self-defense and kind of how the martial arts community sees self-defense and their right. views and their opinions and the difference between kind of what we do and, yeah. um, you know, our, our personal opinions and views on that. I mean, um, yeah, of course, like you and I were talking about some things the other night. So, I mean, I'd like to just go ahead and kind of address that or maybe go over some of that tonight and we can do it here on this uh, on this video versus just us talking about it, maybe some information that people might be interested in. Yeah, absolutely. What, what you got? Well, um, well, let's start with some things that we were talking about last night, the difference between self-defense and point fighting. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I was in, I was in the, the, the community group, you know, from my local area, and someone was asking about, you know, that they're looking for self-defense classes, you know, and, and this was an adult. And a local school owner commented, you know, talking about, you know, that, that they're a self-defense school. They, there are, you know, um, I, 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 I want to say it was Kempo. You know, and they're talking about, you know, because Kempo is a self-defense based art, you know, they have like 300 self-defense techniques, you know, from white to black belt, and then that they can provide, you know, the education that this person was looking for. But actually knowing this instructor, like, they're a 100% sport. Like, everything they do is point fighting, creative forms, musical forms, XMA, like, like everything is tournament based. And there's really no self defense aspect, you know, there's really no self defense training at all, at least how you and I would, 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 would classify it. So I kind of feel like, you know, martial artists in general just either don't understand what self defense really encompasses, or, you know, they, they, I, I don't want to say anyone's going to, you know, intentionally mislead the public, you know, but, people didn't need to really look at themselves and kind of be honest about what they do. Like if you do sport, do sport and own it. Like if your, if your job is to, to create champions, then great. Then, then go create champions, be the best you can be at sport. But self-defense is entirely different. You know, it, it's an entirely separate animal. And when you say you teach self-defense, like you're like, people are putting their lives in your hands. And if you're out there teaching them, you know, point fighting, that's, that's going to get somebody killed. No, I, I definitely agree. I think, um, I mean, I would agree. I think one of the biggest issues when it comes to martial arts in general is that most people don't ask questions. We have this weird idea, this weird philosophy, this weird um, teaching process in, in martial arts, in my opinion, like from day one, don't ask questions, don't question sensei, do as you're told, you know, God forbid you ask a question or God forbid you, you know, challenge a technique. You can challenge a technique and not be rude about it. You can challenge a technique, and not be disrespectful. And so the other problem I think is that when you are a individual coming into martial arts and you don't know much about it, maybe you're new to it, maybe you've seen your friends or family do it, but they're familiar with just the sport aspect, the idea that you can kick, punch, block, um, you know, you have trophies and awards and all these other things that you can do self-defense or you can defend yourself. And realistically, you and I know, we've talked about it in the past, um, even having a sport background, eh, it's kind of that 50-50 of, you know, Right. It's better than not knowing something, but it's just not enough. But the reality is, is that if that person gets lucky enough to get off a sport technique, it may be effective, it may not be. But the real question is what happens whenever they throw that really nice high round kick or that really nice spin kick and that person eats it, you know, yeah. then what? Or they throw that nice little tag back fist and, you know, things go south. Right. Um, I mean, in general, I think, I, I would agree, I think the biggest issue, at least in our area here in Ohio, is that you know, most people don't want real self-defense. I don't think people, it's not necessarily that they don't know what it is or they don't have an idea sometimes. I think it's more of that they just don't want it. Nobody wants to be punched, kicked, slammed. Um, nobody wants to deal with real weaponry like knives and guns. Um, nobody really wants to kind of be pushed to that limit. It's just not beneficial for them. They feel like, you know, they pay enough money. They can go win some tournaments whether it be karate, taekwondo, kung fu, BJJ, whatever it is, and their instructors pat them on the back, give them a good job, you know, they pay a fee, they get their belt, and, they, and they're happy with stuff like that. No, 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 I think you're absolutely right. And, and when people find out, you know, what, what self-defense training really encompasses, at least as far as you and I teach it, right, like, it is so much more than going to class, you know, punching, kicking. I mean, I mean, choke escapes, wrist escapes, and all, and all these things are great, but – at least to me, like self-defense training has to encompass everything that goes on during a violent attack. 
right? Like the physical te- techniques are so down as far as the, 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 the level of importance, right? You know, like a punch is a punch, kick is a kick. So yes, in that aspect, like sport training does help you a little bit. But when you are like being attacked, you know, people need to understand what actually happens to your body. You know, what, 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 the, the adrenaline dump, the, the psychological stress, the, the tunnel vision, the loss of fine motor skills, all these things come into play. And the only way to train that is to simulate it and, and to get your body used to functioning in, in that heightened state. And you're right. People don't want it. Like people want to go to class. They want to have fun. They, they, they want to feel empowered. They don't want me shoving a gun in their face telling me, you know, get on the ground or I'm going to shoot your kids. And like this, this is uncomfortable, but that's, that's self-defense training. That is preparing you for the real world. And you're well, right. I agree. There's, there's definitely a difference that I think people tend to forget too. Um, because self-defense is such a broad term and everybody's used to that word as self-defense. Like, oh, I got a black belt. I can protect myself. Oh, I have a black belt. And that black belt doesn't mean nothing. I hate to say it, but that's just some shit around your waist. Let's just be honest. Like, oh, you know, right. that belt is not as important as the knowledge and the information. You have to be able to have good verbal skills. You have to be able to recognize situations before things happen. You've got to be able to recognize a, a crisis when it starts to break down. Like, there's things you got to understand. It's not just you know, physical, like you were saying. The other problem is, is that when you look at most martial arts instructors, they just don't know. Yeah. They just don't know. They've been fed this information for so long. It's kind of like the military and law enforcement and all these other things. Of course, you know, with me having the public safety background and you being in private security and other people that we know, they've been involved in law, law enforcement and so forth, so on. But the problem is, is that it's sometimes the training is bare minimum. You know, you graduate the police academy in six to eight months and then there's no more training. Like you don't recall or do anything for a year. You're required to do all this extra training yourself and it's bare bones minimum. You know, and they're sending officers out here to do these jobs and protect themselves. And, you know, then there's this big issue as to why officers are shooting people. And I mean, it's a whole nother story, but self-defense is self-defense, but then you have self-protection also. There's a difference in my opinion. The the difference between self-defense and self-protection. So actually, let, let, let's touch on that. So like in your mind, like what is the difference between self-defense and, and self-protection? So self-protection starts way before things become physical. You know, things, self-defense is whenever things have already become physical. They're already in my zone. I can't get away from them. I can't walk away. I can't run away. And now I have to actually put hands on. That's a little bit different. Self-protection is being aware of my surroundings, being aware of situations, acknowledging things like, oh, this person over here is acting a little funny. And there may not be nothing wrong with them, but I still want to keep my eye on them. Right. Um, you know, maybe, oh, there's four or five people here. So instead of me doing this, I might walk back into a building, wait a few minutes till they leave. If they don't leave, I might find another way to leave if I'm uncomfortable. You so, know, self protection uh, is more self awareness, in, in in my opinion. Yes. So so, so self protection at that point is is really being proactive. You know, like don't go stupid places where stupid people just do stupid things. <laughs> right. Right. Like I mean, and then. You know, realistically, things are getting worse as time goes on. And, For real. you know, our generation is changing and the way that people are responding are changing. The drugs are getting more more aggressive. Um, people are more free with the drugs. They, yeah. you know, it's not just marijuana, not just, you know, cocaine, I guess. Like, people are doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. And you start mixing these drugs and things get out of hand. Um, you know, realistically, I think my, one of my concerns is, is that, when this whole COVID scare crap is over and people actually get to venture back out into the world, whenever that may be, no one's going to know how to function. They're right. so used to being confined to this little area. Um, yeah. They're so used to everything. I mean, it happened so fast that everything was taken from us to an extent to where when people do get out in public, they're not going to know how to function. They're not going to be able to recognize the, the signs yeah. of danger. They're not going to be able to recognize the, the awkward movements and the things that people are doing that could possibly put them in danger or get them kidnapped or even killed. Right. And, 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 and even for, 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 from, from a, a personal standpoint, whatever social skills people had are gone. You know, we, oh. we, 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 we see that on the internet all day long. You know, pe- people just right. don't know how to talk to each other. And, and situations are going to escalate just from that. And, it, well, and that's the other thing, too. It's, it, right now it's a game of, people are just trying to keep themselves entertained. They're trying to find something to do. So they're, you know, running their mouth online, um, talking crap to people, starting internet wars, those kind of things. But when the time comes to where things are going to be more open and people are going to be more functional, 
I am definitely concerned to the point where I think things are going to be more dangerous. People are not going to know the function. They're just, and when we talk about self protection, I think, I think we have these bad habits ingrained in us from when we're little. Yeah, it's it's great to teach your kids, you know, poke them in the eyes, kick them in the groin, hit them in the throat, all these things that you can learn from TVs and movies and and that kind of thing. And yeah, I'm sure some of that stuff helps, but realistically, when we talk about self defense, we don't talk about the the, the real response of the body of what happens when you're in the middle of a fight, the right. difference between fighting for your life and just a little scuffle. You know, many people don't talk about that. You know, one of my <clears throat> biggest pet peeves when it comes to self-defense specifically, because I think anybody can get lucky enough to throw a couple good strikes, but I think right. firearms is right. a problem for me. Right. And I feel like you have all these instructors out here, some with information, some with good knowledge and others that have none. Um, I don't think you should be teaching firearm disarms if you've never shot a gun. I don't think you should be teaching firearm disarms if you've never had to take a gun class, period. If you know nothing about firearms, not just about shooting them, but basic information <clears throat> such as anatomy of the firearm, what the gun does, what type of gun is a double action, single action, you know, how many rounds does it hold. There's so many different things about different guns and guns are changing all the time. Right. And we have these instructors out here that, you know, have this idea, well, this was taught to me by my grandmaster, and then my grandmaster taught me this, and I was taught this, and then now I teach you because it always works. Well, no, it doesn't always work. And what happens when it doesn't work? You're going right. to run around with brown streaks in the back of your pants, and you're going to have this puddle in front of you. Yep. You're going to freak out. I mean, that's just what you're going to do. Everybody's a badass. Everybody. Everybody, until that gun is in your face, until you actually experience legitimate cold steal a real gun in your face you never wait, wait, you can't really explain that to anybody you just can't respond properly no you're right and, and, which, goes back, which goes back to what we were saying earlier like people just don't want to train like that and, and, and i guarantee you there's gonna be people out here who say like it's negligent to train like that you know i mean they're probably right but but like it's important to really simulate and replicate as, as as safely as possible of course and obviously you know we we, we want to take precautions and, and not you know be out here killing our students but you know being able to replicate as much as possible the actual stress of being in that situation so you know like you know how, like can you function at a heightened state and, and if so how well so no i i definitely agree i think part of one of the issues is, is that like you said people don't want to train that way and People are afraid to train that way, but when it all comes down to it, here's the thing. Um, you know this, people that don't know me don't know, but obviously um, I'm a firearms instructor. I've been one since, a licensed instructor since 2012, um, not only for the NRA, but also working with public safety, teaching firearms for that as well. And we teach different classes, those kind of things. Um, but firearms can be taught safely. You can do self-defense safely with a real gun. There's snap caps, there's training rounds, there's BB guns, there's CO2 rounds, which I don't recommend using the actual yeah. pellets, but I do recommend using the CO2, the gas, just the, just the air from it, just in general, just to give you that, that jump. Um, there are options. I suggest, you know, using uh, starter pistols, starter pistols so that you get that loud bang, get that shock going through your system so that you just don't go, oh, I have this amazing gun in front of me. It's plastic and it's wooden. And since it says do this and oh, wow, fantastic. And I've got this gun. And then you have these people out here that, you know, do the most perfect technique. It's like 100%. It's amazing. You know, Bruce Lee would be proud. And then at the end of the day, they're holding this gun and they don't know what the hell they're doing. They're holding a gun like this or right. they're holding the gun with their thumbs crossed with the slides. Right. right. There's all this crazy going on. So what good does it do you to disarm a gun and then possibly shoot yourself or right. shoot the person that's with you or to accidentally shoot that person, even though we have the stand your ground law sweep in the nation, but like legitimately it's amazing by the way I mean can you justify that when somebody doesn't have a weapon there's so many different things and then on top of that let's let's kind of veer off on this little bit of ramp for a second so then let's say you do everything perfect and you have this gun in your hands what happens when that person is just out of their mind they don't care they're on drugs or they just have a death wish and they bomb rush you and they take that gun from you because you don't have any weapon retention skills then what no the 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 firearm is always our firearm until the situation is over. You know, absolutely. Any weapon, any weapon brought to a fight, gun, knife, board, club, um, 
pool cue, like any weapon brought to a fight, it's never just your weapon, period. It belongs to everybody that's around there. And you just have to hope and pray that you are good enough to hold on to that weapon. Yep. That's, that's just how it is. And then, and, and then what happens, you know, then what happens, like, you, you have this perfect disarm, you know, you know, sure, why not, right? You take the gun away, they bum rush you, gun goes click. Then what? <laughs> I mean, yeah, is, you know, that, that people, like, need to think about. Well, you know, people don't, most instructors, at least in my experience, and especially me coming up, like, I've had really good instructors, people that really were, they were clean, they were strong, they were fast, that, like, there's no question about it. And they knew their stuff, and they demonstrated techniques, and they actually use some of this stuff. So I'm not saying that they're wrong, but there are things that they just didn't know. Right. And well, yes, you take the gun and, and you, let's say that person decides that he pulls a knife out at you. And now he wants to run at you for some odd gun own reason. And you try to shoot him. And like you said, the gun just goes click. Well, why did the gun go click? Is there a double feed? Is there a jam? Is the magazine not seated properly? Yep. Does it have a hand fire? Is it bad ammo? Was there no gun? Was, it, was there no ammo in there? Like, there's all these different things that are going on. What happens when you do take the gun and you pull the trigger and it doesn't work? And you're like, well, shit, how does it, and it's not firing, then what? Yep. You know, you know how to make, get that gun back into work so that you can use it. You know, do you understand tap, rack, pull back, move off to the side, hands off to the side, thumbs off to the side, finger off the trigger unless you're going to shoot like bare bone basics. And then how are you going to handle your kid being with you, your husband, your wife, your whatever, your grandmother, you know, then what? Well, no, actually, you know, that's a really good point. Like a, a lot of self, a lot of self-defense techniques you see, you know, good, bad, and different. They don't take into account other people being like next to you, like having to defend the person. It's always, you know, two people in a padded dojo. All right, you ready? Right. And they grab and we you know whatever it is. Well, like you said, what happens is, you know, you're there with your kids, your wife, you know, whoever it is, like the techniques change, the mindset changes um, when we get to firearms. You know, that, you know, all these things, you know, you, you just take, take that into account. No, definitely. And, and like we were talking about earlier, you know, the, the live action, the live training, the aggression has to be there. You can't, part of the issue that you see with most traditional schools, and, you know, I'm sure we're going to burn in hell for saying these things, because, you know, God forbid we're sacrilegious if we talk about this stuff. But right. the, the truth is, is that you have these situations where they instantly just walk up to the, to the person and they, put the gun in front of them and it's nice and straight and it's right to their head and and it's and it's, there's this technique and then they do whatever they do. There's never any real dialogue. And then there's nothing to force that student or that individual to have to properly respond. Right. You have to scream at them. You have to curse at them. You have to get their adrenaline pumping. You have to shove them. You have to bump them in the head with the gun. You have to do all these things. You have to tell them that you're going to do all these nasty things to their family. You have to make things as realistic as possible. Yes. Because if you don't train the way you want to react, you won't react the way that you train. The military does it. Law enforcement does it. The fire department does it. Why in the hell aren't martial artists doing it? Well, because martial artists are out here working with law enforcement and they're doing these no contact self defense workshops. Like I actually saw a flyer the other day. It, it was literally a self defense workshop put on by a local sheriff's department with no contact. So what are they learning? How is there no con? Like I don't understand that. How is there no contact? No, like flyer, no contact. Period. Like so, how do you? So is it like verbal judo kind of stuff? Like, I mean, well, are you just are they working on their are they, are they working on their team? Are they doing like a key? <laughs> I mean, as far as I understood, like they're gonna go out there, like like they're gonna hit some pads, you know, can get you know, <laughs> you know, go out like you know, and and, and, and be Billy Badass, you know, be beating the hell, beating the hell, beating the hell, beating the, the, the hell out of a pad, you know. <laughs> Man, I bet that pad got worked. <laughs> I mean. I don't know. I, I think, I think it's, I think for me, so since I'm, you know, since I'm not a traditional quote unquote traditional martial artist and I'm not a sport guy, I'm not an MMA guy, you know, I, and I don't know everything. I mean, I, for me, things have to be realistic. You know, I mean, I think about all the students that I've trained and all the people that I've worked with and all the people that I've been trained by and, you know, realistically, you know from experience until you have those things like really put in front of your face and until things are legitimately aggressive and until you actually have that pressure yep. you don't understand because every single person thinks that they are 
skilled and that's because their instructors told them or because they put so much value into their belt rank or their level or because they you know they're national champions that trophy is not going to jump off the shelf and save their ass nope and 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 if we're we're on that subject nothing is going to save their ass except their own personal training like doesn't matter who their instructor was doesn't matter who they train with doesn't matter if their instructor was a badass like at the end of the day, you are responsible for your own safety, a hundred percent. You know. No, that's legit. So it's it's always going to be that battle between you and whatever higher power you believe in. You yeah. know, that's just the nitty gritty of it. And there's not a single technique, and that's something that frustrates me too. Is that you have these one hundred percent guarantee techniques? This, you know, one hundred percent this, or you know, karate is one hundred percent. Brazilian jiu jitsu is one hundred percent. It is the best art for self defense. That's fantastic. That's great. I study BJJ. I'm under, you know, Master uh, Master Machado, Carlos Machado. You know that, you know, um, I was against BJJ for a long time. You know that as well. And then I went ahead and got involved. And, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with the training. But at the end of the day, what do you do if you don't sink that choke in quick enough? What do you do whenever I've already set my mind that I'm going to stab you? So you can put me in whatever hold you want, but I'm going to get to that and I'm going to stab you. Now, granted, I'm sure that they have, you know, there are tons of people like Master Machado, Carlos Machado. I am 100% certain that nobody's going to pull a knife out on him and get away with it. I'm sure of it. And I'm sure that, you know, uh, you know, um, Master Yagi Sensei, he's not, I'm not worried about, you know, him for Okinawa Goju. Like somebody pulls a knife out on him. Like I'm not worried. Like there's, there are instructors that 100% I'm sure of that can do these techniques. But for the average individual, these are people that have been training their whole life. Right. For the average individual that comes in and says, hey, I want to take a martial arts class. I want to learn self-defense. I'm afraid to walk home at night. I'm afraid to walk through my dorm. I'm a, you know, I was attacked one time, you know, whatever these things may be. And then on top of that, you have, you have other situations, you know, not just focused on the firearms, but then you have people that have been sexually assaulted people that have been abused, people have been, that have been beaten. And you have instructors that can't recognize that abuse in the individual. Right. And they just teach them these patty cake things and they go, this is great, this is going to work. And then they come up and they grab them and they're nice and it's, oh, this is fantastic and, you know, great job. But there's nothing to force that individual and this sounds really, this well. This sounds really crappy to say it this way, but it's the only way I can word it. And right. so maybe if I find a better way, so that I don't get, uh, you know, purged for it. But um, to force them to relive some type of trauma, this on, the only way to get that individual to properly respond is to, in my opinion, get them to to have that same type of fear. And now it doesn't have to be one hundred percent that type of fear and that in that adrenaline rush, but you need to get them to go. Oh shit, this is bad. You know, and their mind is going to click back in and they're going to, you know, if they have PTSD or whatever it is, sadly enough, that needs to kick in so that we can show them as instructors, you can fight through this instead of curling up and crying. I don't know how many times you and I have done seminars together for people and we look at the individual and we're like, yeah, we know what happened. We don't have to say nothing. They start crying. They don't want to participate. They don't want to do things. And we force them to fight through it. And how many times are they appreciative for what they had to do? You're right. All the time. Yeah. So now, granted, you know, we have that like one or two percent that are just like, oh, you know, I don't want to do this. I'm leaving. I've in all the time of doing this, though, in all my time of teaching, I've never had anybody ever walk out of a seminar. They just don't come back as a regular student because it's too much for them, and that's okay. I mean, you know, I respect that individual for that, but so I can't lie. To you. No, 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 absolutely not. Um, and, 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 and as instructors, like, that's one of the most important things is just being honest, like, with your students, you know, like, being honest about what you teach, honest about who you are, what, what the focus of your school is, you know, things like that. Um, you actually have a really good point about, you know, people like Master Machado about, about, about you know, the, your instructor in Okinawa. And these are people who've been doing, you know, quote, unquote, traditional martial arts their entire lives, and, and there's there's no there's no question whether they can, they can protect themselves. But on the flip side, you have a lot of traditional people out here and, and it, it's going to piss some people off. You know, we all know that traditional systems can and, and are effective if they're trained properly. The problem right. is, the problem is you have, you have these traditional people out here saying that they teach self-defense as long as you stick with it. Like 
you you come to class, you keep training, you you learn the kata, you you you, you learn you learn the renzoku, you, you learn the ipon kumite, you learn all these all these traditional aspects, and at some point it's going to make sense. And you, ten years from now, you're going to be a badass. But how does that help the woman who's being battered at home like that night? Like, how does it help you know the guy who's afraid to walk to, you know who's who's afraid to walk to his car? Like, so as instructors, we need to be able to recognize the students' needs. And, and be honest with them. Like, listen, like, yes, my, you know, you know, just as an example, like, if if you teach, you know, taekwondo, right? You know, we all know taekwondo, if if taught properly, is really is, is an effective art. But if you're out here right. like, teaching point fighting, you're teaching, you know, a a a, a, a lip type sparring, and so and you have this woman coming to you that like she's afraid to go home that night, like none of that is going to help. And, and, and telling her, you know what, stick with this. You know, in a couple of years, you're going to be an athlete. You're going to be a champion. You, you're going to learn, you know, very powerful techniques and you'll be able to use them. How does that help them now? <laughs> you know? Well, of course it does. And that's, that, that is always a big issue. So I think one of the other issues may be that martial artists forget that not everybody's a martial artist. And so... You, a martial artist should not be teaching self-defense because they're going to teach as if it is martial arts. Right. Martial arts instructors, like you take a Taekwondo person as an example, you know, we can talk about Taekwondo because we're Jido Kwan, right? You know, we're we got all the fanciness, so we can do that, right? Mm -hmm. So you take Taekwondo, you take Jido Kwan, right? And you have all these people that, that study this, this particular martial art. Not everybody this way, but, you know, they come in, they have this student, and they want to learn self-defense, so they teach them things that are not, like you said, they're not effective. They're not usable right now. And so the, the, the problem is, is that most martial arts instructors teach as if they're teaching a martial arts class. Right. Self-defense is not a martial arts class. It just isn't. Right. And so you have to be able to strip away all the, you know, you shouldn't be bowing in into a self-defense class. You right. shouldn't. That's my opinion because it's self defense. Yeah. And now, if you want to wear your uniform and wear your belt because that's how you feel comfortable teaching, that's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. But you still shouldn't be bowing in in class. And yes, yeah. you can teach effective self defense. And yes, you can teach all these things and not curse and do all these things. But if you are one of those people well, that is loud, a lot like me and a lot like you, we are going to push you past your limit. You yeah. can't, you, if you're going to teach, traditional martial arts and you're going to say stick with this learn these forms and you know you're going to be amazing in five years or whatever that crap is that people say yep. the moment you start teaching taikyoku the moment you start teaching um you know hell i mean any any form the heian forms the pain on forms any of the kuki one form it doesn't matter the moment you start teaching that first form you yep. should be instantly going first movement look block here now this is what this does this block is not a block. Let's just get that out of the way. It's yep. not a block. It's a throw. It's a lock. It's a pin. It's yep. a trap. Oh, well, no, we don't pull this hand back for this amazing amount of power. No, I don't need to pull this hand back for power. I have power from right where I'm at. Yep. No, it's called a hinky tape for a reason to grab and pull, pulling hand. Well, what yep. are you doing? Pulling somebody in, trapping them. And if we would teach people like that, where I go, okay, first form, turn low block, slide up, punch fantastic oh well you know who's gonna step up and punch with this oyazuki seiken well realistically i'm not punching well nope. what are you doing i'm throwing you i'm breaking your arm i'm snapping the arm underneath that's what i'm doing yeah i'm grabbing your throat <laughs> you know whatever it right. is I mean, <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> a couple nights ago i i i was teaching self-defense at at a, a sport taekwondo school and all we did was take a look at their forms and I was like, look, I was like, what if I told you like Taekwondo is a grappling art? And they're like, what are you talking about? And we literally just broke down the applications of the forums. So, and like you said, you know, a low block, no. Like you have me in a clinch, I'm grabbing behind your jaw and, you know, dropping you down, pop here. Like we're, we're taking your sport forms and I'm giving you guys real applications to them. And, and just the light bulb, the, the epiphany that was going on in their minds. Like one student actually thanked me, he came up to me. Um, he was 16 years old, he was brown belt you know, and really good practitioner. He's like, listen, he's like, I can't thank you enough. He's like, I, you know, I'm a good fighter, but I'm, I was, you know, concerned. Like, if I get into a situation, like, what am I going to do? Am I, I going to point fight the guy? 
Like, yeah. I feel like you're giving me actual skills that I can use. And like, that's what it's all about. I mean, martial arts is great. Tradition is great. And, you know, and, and, and all these things are important to us as martial artists, but too many people forget that these, that these arts, like the word martial, warlike, military, combative, like these are warrior arts first and foremost. And if they're not viable, then it's not martial arts, but that's a whole right. other- that's a whole other tangent. No, 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 it's, it's legit. So the thing is, is that, you know, we do have to remember, though, that I agree with you 100 percent. But then we also have to remember is that, you know, the wars that we're fighting is not the wars like it was back then. So the wars that we're fighting as martial artists now are more emotional, more mental, more physical on a level of being able to move physically, not so much punching and kicking, but we're fighting a war within ourselves consistently. And so that's where we have to be able to add the idea of martial and art to combine those two together. And we tend to forget that as martial artists. And, you know, then we get caught up in the business aspect of martial arts. And, you know, you and I, we, we talk about that all the time. And there's a reason why we're realistically, we're broke. We don't run you know, super expensive schools. We don't have large schools and, you know, we don't have those things because let's face it. Let me take that back. I'm before I even say it, I'm a bad, I'm a bad, horrible, horrible businessman. When I met you, you were a good businessman. I don't know what happened to you. Don't follow me, man. Stop following me. You know, you had how many students when I met you? When you met me, I had like 75 students. 75 students. Before you, before you started getting involved with me, how many students did you have? Uh, at one point, like I think the highest number of students I had was like, was like 110, 112 maybe. But that's the thing. Back then I was teaching sport. I, I was teaching what people wanted. But it wasn't something, you know, that, that, that I believed in. And actually, um, here's something that, that a lot of people don't know. The entire reason I made the switch from sport martial arts to self-defense, I, I had this one student of mine, and, and he was literally a national kickboxing champion. You know, he was 13, 14 years old, went, went to high school. He got, he got jumped by three guys. Got, he got his ass kicked. And he came to me. He's like, sensei, he's like, I'm a national champion. Like I fight, like, why did this happen? And like, it kind of flipped the light, you know, that, that, that light switch in me, like, like, no, like this shouldn't happen. Like if I'm teaching you martial arts, I mean, yeah, like you can fight in the ring, but there's more to it. And that's, right. you know, getting into like the whole self-defense aspect and really diving deep into it and really trying to understand self-defense. And then, that, you know, and, and that, 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 that's when you and I hooked up, you know, and, and now we're here. Yeah, I think, I think no matter what, you know, specifically, I, I guess I can't speak for you 100%, but I can speak for me. I'm always going to go against the grain. That's just what I do. And there's nothing wrong with having 100, 200, 300 students. There are people oh, that I know that have 200, 300 students, and they are amazing instructors, and they're doing an amazing job for the community, and they're doing things that other people just aren't doing that can't, that other people just can't do. So, right. you know, you know, I would, you know, kudos to them, legit. Like, so I'm not saying that because you have a, lo- a large school or a lot of students that you're not a legitimate martial artist or that you don't have mm-hmm. good martial arts skills because that's, yeah. that's crap. I know a ton of them that are good. What I'm saying is, is that sometimes people, and we see this more in the smaller areas, um, you know, at least I do, where people focus more on the business aspect of, you know, making a quick buck, making some money, you know, maybe they were, champions at one point in, in tournaments and then they wanted to kind of make money and start doing it that way um so you know one of the things that i've had to come to terms with recently is there's nothing wrong with being paid and making money as something you're passionate about not at all not at all you know being paid isn't, being paid isn't dirty <laughs> i mean if you can get paid to do what you enjoy doing why not do it right no, no. don't and, and, don't hustle and lie and cheat to people. Cheat people are exactly. exactly. At the end of the day, it just comes down to being honest. Like as martial arts, you know, instructors and school owners, like we have to be honest with our people. Like when they walk in the door, we have to have enough self-respect, enough respect for the person who's standing in front of us to say, you know, like you know, someone walks into my school and, and, and you know they 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 want kung fu, they want Wing Chun. Well, you know what? I don't teach that. But, you know, there's a school down the street that does. I'd be happy, you know, to give you their information. We, we have to have enough respect for the person in front of us to say, no, I don't teach that. No, I, I am not the school for you. Let me help you try to find one instead of trying to sell everybody and, and, and convince everybody that walks in your door that 
that they need to be there, they need to pay you and, and everything else. Like, be honest about what you do, own what you do, be the best at what you do. And if, and if they want something that you don't offer, it's okay. Like, it's not the end of the world. And it, it, it's not a reflection on you. I, I, as an instructor, as a man, you know, I, I feel like, you know, too many people get butthurt and, and, and get their egos, you know, hurt when, when someone says, you know what, like, this isn't for me, but like, that's okay. <laughs> well, yeah. So, I mean, I agree hundred percent. I think ego is always going to be an issue no matter what we do. Like that'll just never change. Um, you should always be able to pass some, pass somebody on to somebody else if, if you can't provide what they want. Absolutely. But you know, one of the other things is, is that <clears throat> most people, at least in my experience here in Columbus, when somebody calls me and says, hey, I'm interested in classes, I always ask them a bunch of questions and because I want to be able to make sure that I'm providing them with enough information. I want to make sure that I'm providing them with, you know, letting them know like, hey, I can provide this or I can't provide it. And I never have anybody call me and say, hey, I want to learn karate or kung fu or whatever. You know, there, it's always this weird thing of where they think karate, taekwondo, and kung fu are all the same art. Um, there's this weird thing where people just think that automatically because you have a black belt, you can teach them self-defense, um, you know, and TV and movies have probably caused a lot of issues with that stuff, of course, over time, but nobody ever calls me up and says, Hey, I want to learn judo or I want to learn this. Um, they never do that. They just don't. So most of the time people don't even know what they're looking for. When you ask them, Hey, what do you want? Oh, well, I want to, I want to make sure that my kid learns some discipline. But then I want to make sure that he can defend himself. But, you know, Johnny, he, Johnny's really quiet. And, and you know, I don't want Johnny getting hit because, you know, he, 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 might, he might not want to do karate anymore. Well, it's not ballet. Right. It's martial arts. It's not like I'm going to just grab Johnny up and punch him in his face, yeah, you know. But, you know what, though? That same parent would sign Johnny up for football. Johnny's in a heartbeat. Gonna, and Johnny's going to get tackled and say, you know what, that's just part of football. But in a heart of course that way, you know, that's because football is this, it's marketed differently. It's a part of our culture. It's a part of our world, you know, and it's amazing. And Johnny may be this amazing athlete and get a scholarship to go to school and all this other crap or whatever it may be, you know, and that's a possibility. So, you know, um, and I'm not saying that people that play sports is, you know, well, you know how I feel about sports, but it's all another story. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. I just, no, you're right. I mean, that same parent will sign that kid up. And then the other thing is, is this, you can't become efficient or even become good at martial arts, self-defense, or even football or basketball for that matter. If you are, if you got your hands in every single sport. So you tend to run into situations where I think parents want their kids to try everything so they can get a feel for it, which is fine. But what, you know but by, by the time they're eight nine ten years old like you already know like what they're interested in what their attributes are like when, 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 when as they're getting older like they shouldn't be doing 10 different things you know well i don't i don't have a problem with people doing like 10 different things what i have a problem with is, is that something always suffers and it's usually martial arts the thing that's the most important now granted is most important in my mind in my opinion you know, they may feel like football or soccer or whatever is more important. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I do think that um, people need to reconsider their reason for doing martial arts. Absolutely. And so I think as, in, as instructors, it is our job, even if we run them away, even if we scare them or whatever it may be. Yep. My class, I just want you to know that – we use real knives. We use BB guns. Yep. Oh, well, you know, you're not supposed to tell people that because they're going to run away from you and they don't want to be involved in your program because you're negligent, you're dangerous, you're all of these things. That's fantastic. You say all those things, but I've been doing this for 17 years. I'm not negligent. I'm not dangerous. And I can assure you that you pull a real weapon on one of my students and they are not going to panic in the capacity that somebody else is going to panic that has never trained with a real weapon. No, no, you're absolutely right. It's funny. Like, like you said, you know, in our school, you know, some of the, you know, that, 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 that I got from you, like live knives, BB guns, um, real guns or training rounds, you know, all these different things. I have never had a serious injury doing self-defense training like that. This mo the, the most serious injuries we've ever had are from sparring. 
<laughs> you know, people getting a broken nose, things like that. <laughs> like, it's funny, like the sport, you know, training that, that everyone, you know, that everyone thinks is so cushy and so safe is where we've had the most injuries where if I pull on, you know, if I pull a knife, one of my students, like you said, you know, they don't, they don't panic to the same level as someone who's never experienced that does. And they're able to function, you know, and, and I mean, obviously, you know, we, we are taking precautions, but there are no injuries. So to, so to say that training like that is negligent, I mean, I'm sure most people, you know, will, will agree that it is, but it really just comes down to the, the control you have on the floor and the culture you have in your school. Um, but, you know, so one of the things that I do, um, every school I know of gives a free trial. It's a free class, a free week, whatever it is. And most people use that to try to sell the student on their school. Where for me it's the complete opposite. No, like I get you out of there. I don't want you to come back if you can't stay. Yep. No, that's exactly <laughs> like that free trial is an interview. Like yeah, yep. like like obviously like you're coming in here, you know, seeing if you like it. But on the other hand, I'm I'm interviewing you the entire time, like making sure you are a good fit to the school, making sure you're going to fit in with the culture I've built, making sure that that you're up to the level of training. You know, like this is a two way street and, and I can't tell you how many people I've turned down that just, you know, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm sure this isn't good for business. I'm sure it's not going to sound great, but people who just don't want to train the way we train and, and that's fine. Like go somewhere else. I, I, I can give you recommendations for some great schools in my area. Like I am not the only school around. I'm the only, right. school, I'm the only school around that does what I do. And if this is what you want, then come train here. But if it's not what you want, it's cool. But, but, and and it, I'd be lying to you if I said, you know, you know what, come in, pay me, you know, he, you know, you get the registration fee, you get your first month, you know, go ahead, let's train. And I, I'm, I'm stealing your money knowing you're not going to last. Yes, yeah, so that's another thing, too, because I hate when people, honestly, it drives me nuts. I hate when people come in, they sign up and, you know, they just don't come to class. I will just tell them, like, hey, look. I don't want to keep taking your money if you're not going to come in. I feel like I'm stealing from you. It's better for you to just go ahead and find another school or whatever it may be, yeah. you know? And, and like, you're right. Not, it isn't for everybody, but you know, on the other hand, if everybody did what we did or what we do, the then we wouldn't be. Place. What's that? No, if everybody did what we did, the world would be a safer place. Well, but the, the, the problem is that we are unique. So it's, it's a positive thing for us, but then obviously, you know, we alienate a lot of people. We alienate a lot of, um, people that are interested in doing things because people people don't like change and people don't like to be challenged. And if they are challenged, they don't like to be challenged in a capacity that can, um, so what is I'm looking for? I guess crush their ego would probably be a good way to put it. Yeah. You know, I mean, people don't like, I've had so many instructors and this sounds bad, but I've had so many instructors, so many other master black belts come in and visit me and tell me about all these skills and all these things and i have an open floor policy if you come to visit me teach man share knowledge teach me something teach my students something i don't want to be teaching you you're a visitor i'll share with you but i want to learn something too yeah of course and they 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 talk about this i've only had a few people come into my school that didn't run from the information like they say, okay, well, you know, let's do some knife defense. And I pull out a real knife. You know, I got this gigantic butcher knife, you know, Paula. You know, we keep Paula around. Now we got a bunch of names for him. Yeah. But I pull out this little butcher knife, and the guy just looks at me, and he's like, what am I supposed to do with that? I said, defense. No, and no. He's like a sixth degree no. black belt. No, you know what? I remember coming up there, very first time I met you, coming up there for my founder's exam, and you pull out that knife, and you're like, by the way, last person last person who took this test kind of got gutted, you threw it into the ground, you're like, please move. <laughs> like, <laughs> and you know what? I'm still here, so I don't know what that says about me. Um, but listen, so we are kind of running out of time, so, so let's do this. If you are looking at someone, and they say they teach self-defense, right, in your mind, what are some really essential things in that 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 n their training needs to encompass? L like you come to my school and, 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 and I tell you, you know, we, we are a self-defense school. What does that mean to you? I and mean, what should that mean to a potential student? I think for me, I would say that some of the things that are most important, I would ask, I would want to know as like how in depth in self-defense you go. 
Okay. Not so much as a technique, but as an in information. So when, when we're talking about self-defense, again, weaponry is a big thing for me. So I think information pertaining to firearms, not just pistols. We're talking long guns, knives, that kind of thing. Um, you know, so I, I think information and, and being able to push limits. I think everybody should have a limit pushed. You should be pushed past your limit and tested to the point to where, you know, you know, as an individual, as a student, what you're capable of because you're never going to believe it until you've been pushed up past that limit and you yeah. come out of that swinging. Absolutely. Cool. No, no, I, I, I agree a hundred percent. Um, th I, I think, I think this is really good. You know, I, 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 I'm glad we actually decided to record it. You know, we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and post it up and, you know, and, and, and you know, kind of put it out to the martial arts community. You know, it's like, what do you guys think? You know, what, 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 what when, when someone says they do self-defense, like, what do you want to see? What is the most important, you know, thing to you? You know, we'll kind of go from there. Well, and that, that it'll be interesting to see what people have to say. And, and I'll, in all honesty, I think it'll be, it'll definitely be interesting. But, you know, may, maybe in the next video, we can be a little more specific. I think this one was specifically just to kind of put feelers out there and see how people respond and how they think and what they react to. And, you know, the, a little bit of a shock factor. Um, well, it'll, the, it'll be interesting. The, the, the shock factor is what we do, right? <laughs> you know, eh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, man. We'll, we'll definitely do another video at some point. Um, I, I am intrigued to see what everybody else has to say. So uh, let's, plan, let, let's plan for something here soon, though. Yes, sir. Listen, so so thank you very much, you know, for, for coming out here. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of late, but, you know, hopefully, you know, ho hopefully this ends up being productive. Yeah, definitely, man. You have a good night. I'll catch up with you. Uh, you too.